Hello, I'm Pastor Steve Crittenden of Epiphany of Christ Lutheran Church in Apache Junction, Arizona. And what a joy it is to be able to worship our God. What a privilege it is to be able to do that with you on this, the day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is a Greek word. It means 50th. It's one of the uh, three pilgrimage holidays in Jesus' day when Jews from all around the Roman Empire would gather together in Jerusalem. This was a harvest festival, and uh, this was one of those times when, with people from all over the empire gathering together, there were people who dressed differently, and who uh, looked differently, and they spoke different languages. And that's so important as we hear the miracle that happens in our Acts reading. And now, let us begin with our prayer of the day. Peace be with you. O oh God, on this day you open the hearts of your faithful people by sending into us your Holy Spirit. Direct us by the light of that Spirit that we may have a right judgment in all things and rejoice in all times in your presence. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading today comes from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, 
Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who, is ca who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Word of God, Word of Life. Hear now the Holy Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, we are gathered uh, remotely on this day of uh, Pentecost, and so often Pentecost is talked about as being the birthday of the church, the birthday of Jesus' church, as though today is July 7, 17, uh, July 4th, 1776. But I have to make a confession to you, I'm really not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable talking about the uh, day of Pentecost being the birthday of Christ's church. And the reason for that is, among the reasons, that the stories that we hear today that take place on Pentecost are stories that are about men. And when we link the birth of the church to these stories about men, we fail to remember what we read in the uh, end of Matthew's gospel. In, in uh, chapter 28, we read there about Mary Magdalene and, and another Mary who have come to Jesus' tomb, and there they hear from an angel of the Lord. And the angel tells these women, go and tell his disciples he has been raised. We also can forget that just one verse before our reading today in John's Gospel, just one verse before this, 
we are told that Mary Magdalene went to the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord. Friends, that's the mission of Christ's church, to witness to the resurrection, to share our stories about how we have seen the Lord. And the work of the church is being done by these two women named Mary, and this is weeks before Pentecost. Pentecost is not really so much the birthday of the church. It's really more the day of the demonstrable anointing of the church with the Holy Spirit. That's not to say that the Holy Spirit wasn't part of the church before Pentecost. Surely the two Marys were being called by the Holy Spirit to witness to what they had seen. No, it isn't that this is the day the Holy Spirit came upon the church. This is the day when in a very demonstrable, visible way, it was made known that the Holy Spirit has been anointed in the church. And here's why it had to be made demonstrable. Here's why it was so easy to miss that the Holy Spirit had been part of the church before that. It's because we can't see the Holy Spirit. We can't see the Holy Spirit. And so in our Acts reading, Luke is searching for some metaphor to use to talk about the Holy Spirit. And so Luke says that the Holy Spirit was a noise like a rushing wind, like tongues as of fire. Similes, actually, that Luke is using here in order to try to get people to understand what they can't see. They can't see the Holy Spirit. And I have to say, wind is really my favorite way of thinking about and talking about the Holy Spirit. And the reason for that is because you cannot see wind. You can see the effects that wind has. You can see the effects of the wind in the movement of clouds in the sky. You can see the effects of wind in the fluttering of leaves on trees or clothes on a drying line. But you can't see the wind. And you can't see the Holy Spirit either. But like the wind, you can see the effects that the Holy Spirit has on those around it. I invite you to, uh, to take a look at one of the other readings appointed for this day, 1 Corinthians 12. That's where there's a list of the various ways that the Holy Spirit gifts God's people. It's how the Holy Spirit is active. And one of the great things that you'll see there is that there's varieties of ways that the Holy Spirit gifts the church. And no single person has all of them. The Holy Spirit gifts the church in such a way that we need one another. Because I need the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you that the Holy Spirit hasn't given me. In John's Gospel, Jesus is grounding the Holy Spirit in this one word, peace. This word that we hear so often in this reading, peace. And it's peace that comes from forgiveness. Peace that comes for, from the forgiveness by God. God and Jesus having forgiven these disciples for sins that they know of, sins that they don't know of, for denying knowing Jesus, and for hiding in a locked room when their faith should have had them boldly in the world. But it's peace that can't be fully known without forgiveness. That's why Jesus is saying here, you have to forgive too. The reason is because you can't fully know the peace that comes from the forgiveness of God as long as we're holding grudges for somebody else. And we're told in this reading that the Holy Spirit, that Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit on his disciples. Well, that's something, friends, that 
we know so much about. We have learned so much in this past couple of months about how our breath spreads in a room. Spreads in a room like these disciples are in. That our breath spreads and goes everywhere and lands on everyone. And that's what happens in this story. That Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit covers everybody. So too in the reading in Acts. The wind is blowing and we're told it filled the entire house. We're told that the tongues as of fire rested on each of them, leaving nobody out of the work of the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you, friends, as you're thinking about, thinking about the Holy Spirit and the inability to see the Holy Spirit, but be able to see the effects of the Holy Spirit, be watchful for that then. Be watchful in your life and in the world around you for the effects that the Holy Spirit is having. Because it is there, and we need to remember that the Holy Spirit is God. Just as Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God. David Loos was a uh, seminary professor at Luther Sem in the Twin Cities. He was also the president of Gettysburg Seminary. And he said this when he was talking about Jesus and what Jesus went through. He said, Jesus was crucified because he included everybody. Jesus was ridiculed because he took sides with the vulnerable people rather than the powerful. And Jesus was crucified in weakness and shame. Friends, the same is true. As we're recognizing the, the work of the Holy Spirit around us, the Holy Spirit includes everybody. The work of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit falls on everybody, then when they are doing the things that the Holy Spirit calls, we can recognize the Holy Spirit at work there. This refers us back to Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit, love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, generosity, all of those things. Those are the callings. Those are the work of the Holy Spirit. And when they're being done, it's the Holy Spirit at work, regardless of who it is that's doing it. The Holy Spirit isn't simply promised to those of us who confess our belief in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is where the Holy Spirit will go. We can't shelter anyone from the wind. We can't shelter from the breath in a room. And the Holy Spirit goes where it goes. And so whether it's a Jewish person, a Christian person, a Muslim person, a Buddhist, an atheist, it doesn't matter if love and peace and joy and gentleness is happening. It is the Holy Spirit at work, and we need to be watching for that. But one of the best ways, friends, to recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in the world we can recognize it when we, like Jesus, are ridiculed. When we take sides with the vulnerable. Remember what we read in Acts uh, today at verse 13. Others sneered at Jesus' disciples because of the ways that the Holy Spirit had empowered them. And as you read 1 Corinthians today, chapter 12, I want you to look for this at verse 7. That to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The Holy Spirit is meant for all of us. It is meant to improve all of our lives. It is for the common good. The gospel story is a story about God creating community, creating a new community. We have seen in the last few days what it looks like when community breaks down. What it looks like when the voices of the vulnerable are not listened to. 
When that happens, a black man, one of those vulnerable, is killed by one who is powerful. And we see that when desperate people who have learned that their voices aren't listened to unless they riot, we have seen what happens. We have seen what happens when those in power and privilege don't listen to the voices of the vulnerable. When that happens, people die. When that happens, there is destruction and rioting. And it's not right that those things happen, but I get it. I understand that desperation that they have because powerful and privileged people aren't listening to them when they speak in ways that aren't violent. Friends, in the creation of this community that happens in the gospel, we need to remember that Jesus did not institute an army to have God's will come to the world. Jesus didn't institute an army. Jesus instituted a church. And into that church, Jesus breathed the very breath of God. And we have a word for that. There's a word for having God's breath in you. It's called inspiration. There's a great thing about this Pentecost story. It's another promise that Jesus is keeping. Jesus had promised to send the Holy Spirit. And on this day of Pentecost, we get to celebrate that Jesus has kept another promise. But friends, the moment that we are living in right now, it calls for us to, re to respond in Holy Spirit ways, to respond in inspired ways that make the Holy Spirit visible to the world, to respond in ways that glorify God and build up the body of Christ. Because the body of Christ is the very church that Jesus instituted. It's the very church that Jesus breathed into the breath of God. Amen.
And we pray now for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We call on your spirit of unity, giving thanks for our different vocations. Activate and utilize the diverse gifts present in your church that they reveal your love for all. Lord, in your mercy. We call on your spirit of life, present in air, wind, humidity, storms, and oxygen in our atmosphere, breathing energy into all things. Heal with your breath the whole creation, especially those who struggle to breathe due to air pollution, Lord, in your mercy. We call on your spirit of righteousness. Wherever we as a people are divided, unite us. Wherever we are prideful, humble us. Give each one of us a heart for justice and empathy, Lord, in your mercy. We call on your spirit of healing. Bless nurses, doctors, midwives, chaplains, counselors, and hospice workers as they care for those in need. We pray for all who long for comfort, Lord, in your mercy. We call on your spirit of friendship. Give us a spirit of welcome to those whom we meet at this congregation and outside these doors. Surprise us daily with unexpected grace that we rejoice in every blessing you send, Lord, in your mercy. We call on your spirit of hope. Have you, as you have led your saints in all times and places, stir in us the desire to follow their example, leading us from death to new life in you, just as you have done with Judy Holder. Lord, in your mercy, with bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Christ our Lord. Amen. Merciful God, as grains of wheat scattered upon the hills were gathered together to become one bread, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory through Jesus Christ now and forever. We give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need. Awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.
Christ is risen just as he said. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia.